Good morning, Fellowship Church, and happy Mother's Day, moms. We are so glad that you're here to join us. My name is Kara, and I am one of your directors of youth ministry here at Fellowship. We're so glad that you're here. If you could take a moment and share this video on Facebook while you're watching it, uh, maybe take some time to comment, let us know you're here. We're really excited to be interacting with you throughout the service. God, thanks so much for the opportunity for us to get together um, virtually and praise you and worship you and learn about you. Lord, I am excited that we can, um, that we can gather in this way that we can at this point. Um, and Lord, I pray that this time would just be glorifying you, that everything we do would glorify you. Lord, I pray that you open our hearts and open our minds to the worship and the message that you have planned for us today. We love you. Amen.
chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive If you're new here, we're so glad you're joining us. Please text NEW to 62488. We'll send you a digital connect card that's really easy to fill out on your phone. If you could also download our app, uh, it is FC Online and it is so easy to use. Even I can do that and if you know me, that says a lot. Uh, on the app, you can request prayer, you can fill out your connect card, you can fill out your serve card. Um, Lots that you can do. You can um, even join our service on the app. During quarantine, we are staying connected in different ways than usual. Um, and honestly, it's a lot of Facebook. So Tuesday through Friday, we have noon de uh, devotionals with Pastor Anthony. That is on our Facebook page, Fellowship Church Facebook page. We also have Tuesday through Friday um, devotionals with a staff member and that is on our FC Salem members and attenders Facebook page. If you're not currently a member of that page but you um, consider yourself to be part of our church, uh, this is your home church, just request to join that uh, that private Facebook group and we'll get you connected to it right away. Sundays at 6 p.m. we have Zoom small groups. The link is listed in our FC Salem members and attenders Facebook group. If you have children in, normally in Fellowship Kids, we provided you with uh, some curriculum for them to do at home, um, for you to do as a family, and that is posted on Sunday morning uh, on our Facebook page as well. We are so excited to get back to Fellowship Kids, Fellowship Youth, our seniors activities, our young adults groups, our small groups, our newcomers lunches, and everything that we get to do together. But until then, we're so glad that, you, that we can connect with you like this. Your faithful, consistent tithes and offerings during all of this 
is more important now than ever. During a season like this, uh, tithing is a great act of faith, worship, and stewardship. This is an opportunity for you to continue supporting the ministry of Fellowship Church that continues during all of this. Not only does this pay our bills uh, as a church and also pays our staff, but it also helps us meet the needs of the community during all of the crisis. You can give by texting the amount to 84321. You can uh, give on our, on our app, FC Online, uh, on our website, or you can mail a check to our physical location. We are actively giving out food boxes, care packets, uh, food delivery gift cards uh, and delivering prescriptions, groceries, um, and supplies to those who can't go out of their homes. If you'd like to specifically give to, um, to our COVID-19 relief uh, above and beyond your regular giving, that's awesome. So thank you so much. You can do that by typing the word ERF when using text to give or choosing emergency relief fund on the drop down menu online on our app. Now let's pray before we tithe. God, thank you so much for meeting our needs, for, um, for always providing for us during every season of life, especially now as we go through a crisis. Um, Lord, I pray that you would soften hearts to give above and beyond. Lord, I pray that you would, um, that you would have us be good stewards of the money that you give to us. Lord, I pray that, um, that all of the money coming in would meet the needs so miraculously um, above what we could have done without you. Lord, we love you and we are excited to be giving to you. Amen. Can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised to be.
Good morning, good morning, good morning, Fellowship Church. Good morning from wherever you are joining us from today. My name is Anthony Trask, and I am the senior pastor of Fellowship Church in Salem, Oregon. And I want to be um, one of probably many of those you've heard this from already today, but happy Mother's Day. 
Happy Mother's Day, first and foremost, to the beautiful, lovely mother of my children, my wife, Susan. Uh, happy Mother's Day to my mom, Nadine. Happy Mother's Day to my sisters, uh, my niece, who's a mother. Happy Mother's Day to my friends who are mothers. And one thing about Mother's Day is that I kind of look at it as a day just to celebrate not just mothers, but celebrate motherhood, celebrate women, celebrate um, just the amazingness uh, that women bring into our world and the nurturing and the love and the care that they have for children is, is amazing. And we're so grateful for you, ladies. We're so grateful for you moms, grandmoms, aunts. If you're a mother figure in someone's life, we are grateful for you. Um, young people today need both men and women to, to rise up and to mentor and, and to serve them and to help them and to encourage them. And so maybe... Uh, you're not a mom right now or your children are long gone from your house, but look for younger people. Look for younger kids, teens, for you ladies to, to encourage, to support, to mentor. You have no idea the impact, just a little bit of encouragement, how far it can go. So I am uh, privileged this week to be starting a new message series that we're going to be in for at least three weeks here at Fellowship Church, the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to be speaking on one topic this week, and we'll have some other topics the next few weeks from one section of the Sermon on the Mount. It won't be in order. We're, we're picking out some key selections from the Sermon on the Mount uh, to teach and preach to you and to encourage you with. Last year, we spent four weeks looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and I hope to be doing this about once a year uh, to take a look at really what is the teachings of Jesus. You know, what got Jesus really noticed? Was it his miracles? Uh, was it the healings? Was it the resurrecting of the dead? Yeah, it was those things. But if those things weren't accompanied with his word, if those things weren't accompanied with his teaching and his preaching, we wouldn't be talking about him like we are today because people were astonished. Uh, they, they were absolutely mesmerized by the power of this man's voice and the words that he spoke because they were the word, the very word of God. So this particular passage of scripture, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, we find it in the book of Matthew. And we find it specifically in three chapters of the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7, we find the Sermon on the Mount. Now it may seem like it takes up a big part of scripture, like, man, this is three chapters long. But as you begin to read through the Sermon on the Mount, you'll discover that, oh, this is just kind of bits and pieces. And if you just read it as it's written, um, as Matthew records it in his gospel, it's a little choppy almost. And so what we can glean from the Sermon on the Mount is it was uh, most likely a very much longer sermon uh, that Matthew and others were likely taking notes. And so this gives um, us a better look, uh, a, a better understanding of the entirety of it without having to listen to the whole thing. And so three chapters, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, which tell us um, the, the written Cliff's Note account of Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. And we call this the Sermon on the Mount because, wait for it, it took place on a mountain. But when we think about a mountain, uh, we oftentimes think of a kind of a tall, rocky peak that, that Jesus surely must have climbed up to the top of and then preached and spoke and taught this sermon from the very top of the highest mountain peak. In fact, you don't know it because it's behind you right now, but behind you, and in front of me, I am looking directly at Mount Jefferson. Uh, behind you and in front of me, I am now looking at Mount Hood, Mount Adams, and to my left, Mount St. Helens. And so we think of these tall, rocky peaks. Uh, but I want you to know, I've been to Israel. I've been to the place that Jesus spoke, this Sermon on the Mount. And what it really is, is, is these grassy, rolling, beautiful hills. And that's why we brought you here with us today. Uh, we are um, at the top of a hill in far south Salem, um, looking at the beautiful Willamette Valley behind me with all of its lush green trees, grapevines, 
Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place that we live, and it's a beautiful blue sky day today. By the time I'm done with this message, I may be sunburnt. You might watch my skin get redder the further and further we go. And so, um, this sermon that Jesus gives, again, it takes place on this grassy hill. And this grassy hill was on the northwestern shores of the Sea of Galilee, close to several fishing villages. And from on top of this particular hill, you could see, of course, down below the, the Sea of Galilee. And so this hill made for a wonderful place, a natural setting to speak, because Jesus could sit down, he could give this sermon on the mount, and people could sit down below him and hear him pretty well. And so, why was Jesus uh, on top of this mountain? And who was there to listen to this thing that we call the Sermon on the Mount? One more side note before I answer that question is um, a little fast forward in Matthew's Gospel to Matthew 28, where Jesus gives the Great Commission uh, to over probably 1,500 Christians after his resurrection. It happens in this exact same spot. So the exact same place where the Sermon on the Mount is given is also... Uh, very likely the very same place where Jesus would give the Great Commission to go and make disciples. And, and so as we look at this teaching today, um, why is Jesus there? What's he doing there? Who's there with him? And what is it that he's speaking on? Well, well, here is kind of a synopsis of the Sermon on the Mount and what Jesus is speaking on. This is what I would call the inaugural introduction, the inauguration into kingdom living for followers of Jesus. This is all about the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is teaching those who are listening, he's teaching us about what it looks like to be a citizen of God's kingdom. What it looks like for us to follow King Jesus in this new kingdom that he brought to this earth and that he's establishing and building and one day will find fulfillment in his return. Now, as you read through the Sermon on the Mount, please know this is not a list of prerequisites of things that you need to do or obey in order to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. But this is a message for where you're at right now, today, right now, wherever you're at in your walk with Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount is for you. That once you would encounter Jesus, once you would follow Jesus, that his spirit would empower you, equip you, and fill you to be able to follow these inaugural teachings that he gives to his followers 2,000 years ago that we're going to look at today. So, Matthew chapter 4, what's going on? In Matthew chapter 4, we have um, Jesus likely in a fishing village. And the Gospels record that Jesus is now amassing a very large crowd. Um, thousands of people are following Jesus. He's turning water into wine. He's healing people. He's doing all sorts of impressive things. And so there is a mass crowd that's now following him because they want what he has. Don't you want what Jesus has today? They want what he's got. And so Jesus, as he often does, he retreats onto mountaintops. He retreats onto hillsides. He retreats into the wilderness in order to be able to get some time away, to get some rest, and to get some quiet and some face-to-face -face time with the Father away from the crowds. And so he takes his disciples with him from the fishing village. They leave town, and they start to head up this hill on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus sits down, and he begins to speak to them. He begins to teach them. And as he sits down to begin to teach... He, he starts to give this message. He starts to give this three chapters long sermon. But by the time we get to chapter 7, by the time we get to chapter 7, we find out that it wasn't just the disciples any longer who were there. But now it was an enormous crowd. The crowd heard rumors spread about where Jesus had gone and now there was a large group of them there. And so if I imagine myself being one of the disciples listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as I'm sitting there for hours while he's speaking, there is likely many, many people, probably by the dozen, starting to sit all around me and join me. And by the time he's done, there's this crowd that had listened to the words that he had to say. 
So let's go ahead and, and let's open up our Bible and look at what the crowd said of him and spoke about him when they ended up hearing his message. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes did. So again, here he is. He's given this message. He's up on this hilltop. Hundreds, likely thousands of people have now joined to listen. And when they had finished listening, they were astonished at the authority that this man, Jesus, spoke in, spoke the words of God to this crowd. And so today I want to spend a couple minutes, um, again, looking at one part of the Sermon on the Mount. And as I was putting the message together for this time that we're in right now as a world, I thought there was really no more appropriate passage within the Sermon on the Mount than looking at the Lord's Prayer. Um, because I think right now our world, our nation, our state, our county, our city, we need we need to pray more, more than we've ever prayed before in our generation. Uh, pray for a, a healing of our land from this virus. Pray for um, the ability to go and, and work and interact and worship together again. These are things that we need to begin um, crying out to God for. And so I, I believe that as I was looking over all the different portions of the Sermon on the Mount, I just knew this is what we needed to talk about today. And so as we open up Matthew chapter 6 now, Matthew chapter 6, when we get here, Jesus begins a portion of his teaching that is speaking out against boasting about your spirituality. Jesus is warning his followers that when they're doing good, when they're being pious, when they're being obedient, when they're doing good religious things, they should not be doing those things so that others could see or hear. Jesus lets them know it's not about your actions, it's about where your heart is. And if your heart is not doing it for me, but doing it for men, it really doesn't matter to begin with. And so he talks in this way about prayer. Matthew 6, 5 through 8, a couple of months ago, we had a series called Vertical Talks, where we, we looked at this very verse, and I'll just go through it real quickly. But Matthew 6, 5 through 8, Jesus says, and when you pray, he's like, hey guys, make sure when you're doing stuff for me, that you're not actually doing it for others. And so, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they could be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. They got what they wanted. They wanted attention, and attention's what they got. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus says, this is not about you and others. This is about you and me, you and God. You pray to God. God speaks to you. Others can be there. You can pray for others. You can pray with others. But you don't pray for the benefit of others hearing you and being impressed by the things that you say. We're certainly not going to impress God. We shouldn't worry about impressing people. We need to be concerned with being obedient and offering up our prayers to God. And so verse 7 of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, And when you pray, do not, don't heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask it. So, time out. There were people that not only prayed for attention, but, but there were people and there are people today who think that they have to use big words, hard to pronounce words, old words, old English words, incantations, and chants, and all sorts of strange religious things we do in order to be heard by God. And Jesus says, guys, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. God already knows what you need. He wants you to come to him in relationship. It's not about you talking to him and him not knowing these things and finding out about these things so that then he can answer your prayers because he already knows what it is that you need. God just wants relationship. And so, Quit the, shenan quit the shenanigans, quit trying to impress God, quit trying to impress people, and just have a conversation with God. And so that's where Jesus introduces us to what we call the Lord's Prayer. He says this, So then pray like this. So because you shouldn't pray to be seen or heard by others, 
because you don't need to impress God with your words or your incantations or your chants. Because this is between you and God in private. When you pray, guys, I want you to pray like this. So here we have the Lord's Prayer. Now, the problem with the Lord's Prayer in the church today is that oftentimes we think that this is a prayer we have to pray. We have to recite perfectly in order for God to hear us. But if you were just paying attention to Jesus, you would know that's actually far from the truth. Jesus doesn't want us to repeat this prayer and to repetitively have it memorized and speak it like it's some sort of a mantra or an incantation. He just says, because I want this be to be between you and me, I, I want you guys to do it relationally. And so if you're going to pray, here's some things you need to be aware of. Here's some things that you need to cover. And so as we look at the Lord's Prayer, please know it's not a formula of how to pray. It's just an invitation to relational prayer. So Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. And here's where it gets kind of, of interesting. I, I happen to be a, a pastor, and I've been a pastor for uh, about 15 years uh, vocationally. And being a pastor, um, that means that oftentimes I will either perform or be involved in funerals. And inevitably, at every funeral that you perform or go to, uh, the family of the deceased usually likes um, to recite the Lord's Prayer at the end of the funeral. And because I'm the clergy, I'm the minister, people look to me to lead them. And so many people, especially older people, they memorize the Lord's Prayer in the King James and not in a more modern translation. So I always get super nervous that I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer in a way that those at the funeral won't say it. And then I'm going to get tongue-tied and embarrassed and I'm just going to ruin the memorial for their family member. And so typically what I'll do is I'll start off the prayer and, and I'll say, Our Father who... And I'll wait a minute to see if people say, Our Father in heaven, Our Father who is in heaven, or, old school, Our Father who art in heaven. And so whenever I get to a place where I'm not sure how the crowd is going to say, I'll just kind of step back and uh, uh, the part of the Lord's Prayer is... Um, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who um, who are in debt to us. And some people will be, uh, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our, our debts. And, and it's so confusing to know what to say. And I'll oftentimes just say, hey, I'm going to be quoting this from the English Standard Version. Um, you go ahead and, and speak it out just as you want to. And so the Lord's Prayer is where ministers get nervous because we don't know how other people are going to recite it back with us. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this prayer. And again, I, I think there's no more appropriate time than to talk about prayer during this time that we're going through once again as a, as a world, as a, as a nation. And I think on Mother's Day, I know many of you, it was your, it was your mom who, who spent hours uh, praying for you, praying for your salvation, praying for your health, your well-being, your safety, your marriages. Many grandmas praying for their grandchildren. I, I love a praying mother. I love praying grandmothers. Their prayers are powerful and potent before the Lord and, and can literally move mountains and change the world. And I think there is there's no better time than now than to start praying big, bold, audacious, faith-filled prayers to move mountains and to change the world. So let's look at this prayer. Jesus says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus says, When you come to God, come to him like your father. When you come to God, come to him like somebody you know. When you come to God, come to him like someone who wants intimacy with you. And I know it's Mother's Day, but, but God is our Father. And so just like you would go to your mother and ask her for something, just like you would go to your father and ask him for something, God says, come to me like a father. And I understand that carries with it a lot of baggage for many of you who maybe didn't have good mothers or good fathers, but God wants you to know he can be the father you never had. God could be a mother-like figure that you never had because all the attributes that mothers have come from God. God's not confined to gender because we as men and women get these characteristics and traits from the God who creates us. And he says, come to me like a father. 
Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. God wants us to know he is far beyond us. He is far above us. He is incomprehensible to us. We're not just talking to our earthly father. We're not just talking to our earthly mother. We are talking to our heavenly father, our father who is in heaven, who is above all things and who has created all things. Hallowed be your name. God wants us to worship him, to reverence him, to praise him. So come to him in relationship. Come to him acknowledging where he's from and his power. Come to him and worship and praise. Hallowed be your name. It's holy. It's sacred. It's set apart. And so when you come before God, come relationally, but also come reverently with a holy, godly fear and reverence. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, not just our Father who is in heaven, but when you pray, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right now, um, we think that everything going on in our world is like the United States of America come, Oregon come, West Coast come, North America come, United Nations come, European Union come. But I want you to know that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. That's what he said. And so I'm not praying for a nation or a president or a political party to save the day because it's never happened and it's never going to happen. I am praying that Jesus saves the day and I know he already has and I'm awaiting his return where he will rid the world of all its wrongs, all its evils, all its injustices and he creates and he restores this new heaven and new earth where those who belong to him, those who are his children as a father will live with him for eternity. So your kingdom come God. COVID-19 is here. Um, government regulations like we've never seen in our nation are here. But, but friends, this is the time to cry out to God. Don't expect the government to save you. Don't expect the state, the president, our governor to save us. Call out to God for saving. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Not our, not our empires, not our nations, but your kingdom come. Jesus, please let your will be done. Not my will. I don't want what I want. I want what God wants. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So I would say for the majority of our audience today on, in Salem as it is in heaven, in Marion County as it is in heaven, in Polk County as it is in heaven, in Oregon as it is in heaven, in the Pacific Northwest as it is in heaven, in fellowship church as it is in heaven. God, we want your will to be done here where we are, just like it's continuously and always being done in heaven where you reside. Jesus says, when you pray, you pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. Right now, maybe more than ever before, we need to pray for the provisions of God in this generation. Give us this day what we need. Notice it doesn't say, give us this day our daily bread and our cake too. It says, just give us this day our needs. Provide for our needs. Give us exactly what we need. And it was Jesus himself who said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so God wants to feed us physically and God wants to feed us spiritually. And so God, give us our daily bread. God, God, give us more than bread alone. Give us every word that proceeds from your mouth that we can live on during this difficult time. And right now, Fellowship Church and wherever you're watching from, I am praying that the Lord will meet and respond to all your needs. And oftentimes, God gives us more than we need. In fact, I would say God always gives us more than what we need when we look at the entire picture. God gives us more than we deserve with his grace. We deserve hell, but he gives us his son, Jesus Christ, and salvation. And so God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you abundantly. And oftentimes he gives you your daily bread and oftentimes he gives you cake as well. So we praise God in the times of plenty and we praise God in the times where we are forced to depend on him like never before, like right now. And here's this part we always get tongue-tied on. He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our wrongs as we forgive those who have wronged us. Jesus is letting us know here that, remember guys, I'm your source of forgiveness. My life, my coming death, my coming resurrection is 
the source by which you're forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. And so when we pray out to God, remember that he's the one that forgives us. And as Christians, we don't need to perpetuously and continually cry out for God to forgive us because in Jesus, he already has. But we repent, we turn from sin, we, we say and cry out as an act of worship and as an act of gratitude, God, forgive me of my sins. But the moment that those words leave our lips, God reminds us, hey, if you want to be forgiven, you got to forgive others. Why would you expect forgiveness from me if you're holding unforgiveness in your heart? And right now, you might have bitterness in your heart. This Mother's Day, as you're reminded of difficult family situations, you might have anger or hate in your heart. God's reminding you today, hey, I have forgiven you. I'm offering you forgiveness. Why don't you walk in the forgiveness I have given? And why don't you forgive the one who wronged you? He finishes with this. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What Jesus is letting us know is that you guys need to be watching for temptation. God does not tempt you. But oftentimes I cry out and we as a church and as Christians, we cry out, God, remove us from temptation. But then we put ourselves oftentimes in the most temptuous places. We allow ourselves to be tempted and then we complain that we're tempted when we put ourselves in situations where we know we're going to be tempted. Well, tempted with what, Pastor? I don't need to list a list of sins for you to know that oftentimes you turn to that channel. You go to that website. You hang out with that girl. You go and, and kind of walk by that guy. You, you go and, and you walk by that place that you told yourself you wouldn't go anymore, thinking, I'm strong enough, I can handle it. But Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Some of you, God's already delivered you from evil, but you keep putting yourself back into temptation, which pushes you back into evil. And God says, instead, Pray, ask him, acknowledge him to remove you from temptation so that he removes you from evil. This prayer, God wants us to cry out to him today, church. Moms, grandmas, aunts on Mother's Day, God wants you to cry out to him this year, maybe more than you ever have before for the sake of your family, for the sake of the world. And it's not an incantation. It's not for others' accolades. It's just you and God. And Jesus just says, don't follow this formula, but just just be reminded of these things. Our Father, relationship, who is in heaven, far above us, hallowed be your name, worthy of worship. Your kingdom come. We want your kingdom, not our own. Your will be done here in Salem on earth as it is in heaven. Give us all of our needs, God. Give us all of our needs. Forgive us as we forgive others. And and God, keep us from temptation, we ask in the name of Jesus. And then with our church traditions, we've added on to the end. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And though that doesn't necessarily appear in this passage of Scripture, we can certainly pray that very thing. God, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. We've got no power on our own. Yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. So be it. So here's here's how I'm going to leave this with you. We came to this place today to give this Sermon on the Mount. We're sunburnt. We're windblown. But I want you to know God's got so much in store for you. As, As far as the eye can see, God's got great things in store for us. Eye hasn't seen. Ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. Heart of man, we haven't even imagined all that's in store for us, that God has in store for us. And so times might be difficult now, but we have faith in a God who will deliver us. And we have a hope in a future, in a relationship with no sickness, no death, no war, no disease, but relationship with Jesus. And this Mother's Day 2020, Jesus wants relationship with you. Surrender your life to him. Give him your heart. Trust in his life, death, and resurrection to forgive you of sins and restore your relationship with him. Be filled with his spirit. Look forward in hope to everlasting life in him. And let's, as a church, let's begin to cry out to God like never before. And I'm going to ask you to do something maybe a little strange in your homes right now. As Kim begins to lead us in this next song of worship, We're going to give you a couple minutes. And I'd like for you, with your family, your roommate, 
you, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever you're watching church with this morning in your house, in your car. But before we go into this time of worship through song, I want you right now where you are to go join the person in the room with you, in the house with you. If you could just simply hold their hand and could you together as a family, as a couple, as people in relationship, would you pray the Lord's Prayer together this Mother's Day? Maybe you're with your mom right now and you can pray that over her. And if you don't know the Lord's Prayer by heart, that's fine. You don't need to. But we'll give you a little cheat here. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen right now for you. So again, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. You right now in your homes, go join those who are there. Um, if you're in your bedroom and your husband's in the kitchen, get together, guys. Get together with your husband, your wife, your kids. Join hands. And I want us as a church right now to say the Lord's Prayer together all across this city, all across this country, all across this world as we join as one church today. Would you now in your homes cry out to God, cry out with the Lord's Prayer, and then cry out to him in your own words. God bless. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together.
is nothing. Nothing is better than you. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was a great message and great worship. We hope that you were blessed by the service. I know that I was, and I'm so glad that you joined us as well. Don't forget to join us again next Sunday at 9.30. We're going to continue our Sermon on the Mount series. And for my students, I miss you so much. And don't forget to be filling out your prayer journal throughout the week so that we can talk about it on Wednesday for our Zoom small groups. Thanks, guys. See you next week. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never Good morning today.